Thank you so much for joining us. Last week, we talked about the mystery of marriage in regards to roles and responsibilities in the marriage. Today, we want to talk about the romance in marriage. But let me begin with this, some painful facts that we must admit that is present in our world today, both in the church and outside the church. Marriage is under attack on many fronts. One is the lack of time for each other, the couple, and then the lack of communication with one another. Some marriages have strained relationships because of the in-laws, and others could be stressed by financial commitments. It is often easy for most couples to talk to others about these challenges because in many ways, they are socially very acceptable and common or normal to talk about. Yet there is a very real and spreading problem in modern marriages today that is not being disclosed or discussed openly. It is hiding in the shadows. It is one that most are too embarrassed to mention, to admit, for fear of the shame it might bring to them. It is a problem of sexual sin. In fact, many married and unmarried people are struggling with sexual sin. As a result, they are suffering and struggling alone, quietly. You see, we live in a sex-saturated culture. Our society daily bombarded us with images of beauty and sex, from the MTR station billboards to magazine covers. There is no escape from the rising flood of sensuality. With the advent of, of, of the internet, the attack comes from everywhere and at any time. Moral standards are being lowered, and as a result, marriage and the family are being greatly weakened and eventually destroyed. Now, Satan, our spiritual enemy, wants marriages to be weakened, especially in the area of trust for one another. Now, single people, I have a word for us as well that single people can be corrupted to the point where their prospects for a future, a pure and a healthy marital relationships can already be seriously impaired even before they start. Well, it's the best way to destroy your marriage even before it starts, when your sexual purity is taken away from you. So what is the solution, Pastor Ed? Where is the promise of God? Where is the hope, the redeeming hope of Jesus in this topic? We want to turn to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is a very special book. I encourage you to read it. It is a conversation between a father and a son in regards to wise living. In fact, the word my son is oftentimes repeated in this book. And much of the advice seems appropriate for younger people. Other than wisdom in general, in the book of Proverbs, it also addresses the issues of marriage, especially sexual issues, and receive much attention in this book. Now, since it is one of the most powerful temptations, sexual sin, that is not only for young people, let me admit, it is for all people alike, whether one is married or single. So today, I want to address all the groups all the people uh, watching this uh, service, this sermon. Now, today, we're going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 5, to be specific, to better understand the gift of sex in marriage and how to maintain sexual purity, meaning to avoid sexual sin in our lives. Look at Proverbs chapter 5, uh, verse 3. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps follow the path to Shor, which is hell in Hebrew. She does not ponder the path of life, her ways wander, and she does not know it. Verse 8, keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. And this passage talks about, or rather give us a warning against the danger of sex outside of marriage, namely adultery and fornication. So let me begin with this. What is sexual sin? 
Well, simply, it is sex before and sex outside of the marriage. So in essence, it is the act of adultery and the act of fornication. Just look at Proverbs 5 verse 20 again. It says, why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? I thought that this is the definition, the explanation of what sexual sin is. It is when one is intoxicated, controlled, mesmerized, attracted by something that is forbidden, forbidden sex, forbidden women, and embracing the bosom of an adulteress. Uh, Proverbs 5 explaining. Now, uh, the consequence of sexual sin, I think we need to also help to explain because so many don't think of, are not aware of. They only uh, are alerted or rather highlighted the pleasure of sex, but not the consequence of sex outside of marriage. Uh, we want to look at Proverbs chapter 5 again in verse 9. Lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless, lest strangers take their fill of your strengths and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life, you're grown. When your flesh and body are consumed, verse 14, I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Um, you know, the, 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 the book of Proverbs here describes vividly and visibly the consequence of sexual sin. If you look at these verses again, simply in verse 9 and 10 talks about the loss of honor or dignity or reputation and also the loss of strength, vigor, and energy, or rather even health. And then he talks about the loss of success. Success at every, at, at, at every front, success in life. Uh, sexual sin remove and, 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 and rob us of our honor, our dignity, our health, strengths, and our future, our success. And then in verse 11, Proverbs chapter 5, talks about sexual sin uh, causes physical pain and diseases. It comes with a price, physical pain, pleasure before the pain, and then diseases comes with it. And verse 14, a public disgrace. And I think if you live life long enough, you've seen all of this, the whole list of the, the, the points that Proverbs 5 have described here, that is so true, that happens to both believers and unbelievers alike. Now, from verse 15 of this chapter, in this passage, uh, the writer shifts from the negative warnings against adultery, now finally, to something hopeful, something positive, an exhortation toward fidelity of faithfulness. Uh, that, is, that is the passage, or rather the verse we want to look at right now, because this message must be a message of hope, as I began with a moment ago. In chapter 5 of verse 15, he encourages his readers, he said, Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. What, what, is, what is the encouragement? What is the solution, the remedy? Uh, what is the principle to building a blessed marriage? Uh, a marriage that is blessed and happy and healthy for each one of us. Simply, he said, drink from your own well. Uh, that's, that's a very interesting way to word it. Drink from your own source. Be satisfied from your own well, not somebody else's well. Now, the key to understanding this passage is to combine both the form and freedom in uh, Proverbs 15. Now, let me explain. Uh, conservative couples love the form. The form here speaks of being restrained and there's a sense of being controlled with, with rules and boundaries when it comes to dealing with sex or expressing one's physical desire. 
But then there is this, the progressive couples who love and who celebrate freedom and, and simply means uh, being open-minded, to be liberated, where there are no rules and regulations in one's uh, outlook in life and one's relationship and one's marriage that, that, that permits them and, and allows them, uh, giving them uh, plenty of choices to choose from. Uh, so, so here the form and the freedom should be put in balance. It should not be restrictive, but then it should not be without rules and regulations either. Because a healthy, a blessed and a happy marriage flourishes within both the form as well as the freedom. Because sex is like fire. Where you place it will determine if it brings blessing or curse. Just imagine the, 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 your kitchen, where your, the stove where you cook your meals, your food. That fire must be contained. There is a form, and, but then it has also uh, a freedom in that place when the fire is allowed uh, to be present, then that is where you get to enjoy the blessing of your food when you cooked it. Now, uh, but outside the marriage, sexual sin must be restrained and controlled. Inside the marriage, it is to be unrestrained and uncontrolled. I hope you hear what I just said. That balance of form and freedom. Outside of one's marriage, sexual desire must be restrained and controlled. But inside, within the marriage, it is to be celebrated, not to be controlled. Unrestrained and uncontrolled. Self-control is an important part of life in every areas of our life, at every front. And it is, in fact, a reflection, a measurement of one's maturity as well as one's spiritual purity. The fullness and endless sexual, sat and endless sexual satisfaction can and will only be attained and acquired within the marriage. The endless sexual satisfaction, the full sexual satisfaction, the physical, the flesh satisfaction can only be acquired and attained within the boundaries of marriage. And when that happens, there is an added blessing over the marriage from God and for one another and also for your children, your family and friends. Because sexual desire is like a fire or it's like a thirst. Sexual sin is satisfying that thirst with forbidden waters from the wrong well instead of your own well. So here, uh, the book of Proverbs 15 tells us the solution is not to abstain from water, but to drink from your own well. All of us need to drink, but the question is, what are you drinking and where you're drinking from? Sexual desire is normal, but how you satisfy that desire is what he is asking. You should be satisfied by, from your own well, okay, which is your own spouse. Okay, so in Proverbs 5.15, the wife is likened as a cistern, which is connected to a well of fresh water from underground streams. She's not just a stagnant pool for desperate times. She's a source of fresh flowing water. Always present. Always renewed. Every day. Every time. She is the young man's God-given source of sexual satisfaction. Here in the book of Proverbs, the father advising his son. Uh, Paul explains in regards to this in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, the solution here, form and freedom, each man should have his own wife, his own well, and each woman her own husband. Verse 3, the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, 
except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So that's the principle. That's how Paul explained it. The most effective way to fight sexual temptation, sexual sin, to overcome it, is not only to avoid or to abstain it, but to pursue marital intimacy. It is not to suppress it or to oppress it, but it is to release it towards one's own spouse in the context of marriage. Now, as with any temptation, suppressing is often unhelpful and even unbiblical. Rather, one should be directing that desire toward the right place and the right person. For married people, the most basic way to fight sexual temptation and unfaithfulness is to pursue marital intimacy with your own spouse. Now, for the singles, the unmarried, my advice to you is to pursue God's will regarding relationships and purity. Now, to be single does not give you the license to live uh, a callous life in regards to sexual purity. It is not a license at all. The scriptures call believers, firstly, to marry only believers. The followers of Jesus only to marry for the followers of Jesus Christ. And to save the gift of sex for marriage to save it, to protect it, to preserve it, to keep it until the marriage takes place. By doing so, now you avoid many emotional entanglements that will cause you negative effect on your future relationships. Now, you, you are also at the same time when you keep the purity, sexual purity, of your life, you are reserving it, okay, for your future spouse. You are committing yourself to someone that you have not yet met. And that is the attitude that we must have. Committing sex before marriage is simply saying to the person or to others that it is okay to have sex with someone who is not your spouse. Yet, even though that person will be your spouse tomorrow or at some point in the future, you are conveying the idea, you are sending the message one to another to say it is okay to have a sexual relations outside of marriage with someone who is not your spouse yet. In my many years of, of, of helping couples that, that struggles in the area of marital faithfulness, up to this point, uh, my 30 plus years of full-time ministry, it's unfortunate that every one of them, when I see them, I would try to go back to the history and to go back to the root of the problem rather than dealing with the symptom. And so far, I'm always right when I would ask them that you have had sexual relationships before you were married. So far, all of them said yes. And, and, and what does it mean, Pastor Ed? Simply the point again, uh, fornication is building a weak and even a wrong foundation for your future marriage. Now, when it comes to sexual temptation, Satan, our spiritual enemy, wants us to think that we won't take our sin to the next level, that we have enough of willpower and strength, that we are strong enough. Um, and, and the enemy wants us to think that we are stronger than we really are. He wants you to think that you will never go that far. The reality is that you should not even trust yourself. I don't even trust myself because the heart is deceitful above all else. You and I, we are weaker than we think. Sin is like an undercurrent in the ocean. If you play in it, you will be overpowered and swept away into destruction. 
when Yvonne and I, we were courting for four years, uh, you know, by the grace of God, you know, God helped us to understand this area of sexual purity. Uh, you know, we commit that area to God and we kept ourselves accountable to others. And by the grace of God, uh, you know, we avoided those places that will put us into trouble because we don't even trust ourselves. <laughs> and, 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 and now, having married for close to 30 years, I'm, uh, I, I'm really glad that, you know, we did the right thing that first four years of our courtship, that today I have something to give to my children and, and advice to give to us who are still single today. Uh, you know, looking back, I have no regrets at all. I did not miss anything. Uh, so I know that that is possible for all of us as well. You see, one of the ways Satan works is by tempting you to think that purity is a not to be cross-lined rather than a posture of your heart and mind. He wants us to think that purity before God is not kissing, not allowed to, you know, touch her hand. It's not about, you know, <laughs> taking off the clothes or going all the way, whatever that means. Uh, he, he wants you to think that if you don't cross a certain line, then you are good enough that you are pure and you are safe. But that is not true. It's not about having a line that you shouldn't cross. Because if that is so, then very soon the line keep on moving, keep on moving, and then very soon very blur. Okay, it's not about a line. It is about a heart being aligned with God's word and, 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 and God's desire. It's the posture of a heart. Remember, uh, uh, Jesus says that, you know, when you lust after a woman in your heart, you have sinned before God, you have committed adultery. It's not about the act. It's about one's heart, the posture of your heart. It's not about if you have done that or did you do this or not. It's about your heart attitude. It begins there. It deals with the condition of your heart. So, 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 so it's to guard your heart and mind with purity. Okay? Uh, so, you know, the H-O question, how far is too far, <laughs> may reveal a desire to get as close to sin as possible instead of a desire to flee, to run away from sin as God's word instructs us. So I pray that this will help you. This is a very practical advice for all of us. And of course, that applies to married people too. I've always said this, you know, single people should carry themselves as if they are married, responsibly and with wisdom. All right? So if you cannot carry yourself like a married person, responsibly, faithfully towards your future spouse, then the day when you're married, you can never be responsible and be faithful. Because these are the posture of your heart. Remember, it's not the act first. Okay, and I hope that uh, 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 married people, every one of us, should continue to be responsible and act wisely. Uh, you know, so, so and, 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 and that is how you preserve your marriage and this is how you see your marriage can be a blessing uh, to you and your children. Okay, so the next point, uh, uh, Proverbs 5, verse 16. We're looking at the second verse, verse 16. His second advice, and we're going to close with this. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets. Okay, what, what, what is he saying here? He's basically, basically talking about to care for your well, to drink from your well, and now you need to take care of your well. So the wife is like a streams and the springs. She is an active Abundant source of fresh flowing waters. Now, if the young man neglects her, he will lose her. All right? So attention, affection, and attraction leak when physical intimacy is not protected and preserved. One spouse's sexual sin makes the other spouse vulnerable to the same sin. One must be careful. So here, he says, you must Take care of your marriage. Take care of your spouse. Be protective. Two ways to protect 
uh, your marriage. Uh, let's listen to the next verse, Proverbs 5.17. How do I be protective of my marriage? Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely dear, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. So the first, the word is exclusivity. Okay. Your spouse is your spouse. He or she belongs to you. And this is a very special and a sacred privilege. Never ever take that for granted. She belongs to you that God has given her to you. In fact, Paul put it this way, now you don't belong to yourself anymore, you belong to her as well, all right? In fact, this whole idea of the sense of ownership to be not only protective but possessive of your spouse or of your marriage is reflected in Deuteronomy uh, chapter uh, 20, verse 7. Listen to this, Moses <laughs> writing. And is there any man who has betrothed a wife and has not taken her? Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. This is in the context of going to war. And, and Moses said the only excuse, the only time you are being excused from going to the battlefield is when you are a newlywed person. Go home and enjoy your spouse. Be with your spouse. He's saying, unless you die in the battlefield, okay, and another man take off your wife, okay? So he, here he gives us the idea to be protective. Now, this, the sad thing is this, my friends. You know, some people are more protective and possessive not of their spouse, but of their hobbies, of their job, of their finances, their car, than their own spouse. And that is said, they have placed other things above their spouse. And sometimes we are more protective of our children than our own spouse. And that is not good. Deuteronomy 24, uh, 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 verse 5, uh, put it this way. When a man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army or be liable for any public duty. He shall be free at home one year to be happy with his wife whom he has taken. Wow, the phrase whom he has taken does not imply force, forcibly. It restates the intimacy and to hold fast to his wife like the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 24 talks about that, that this is someone that belongs to him and he belongs to that person. You know, in Genesis 2.24, look at this verse. Uh, 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 the scripture put it this way. Uh, uh, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. To hold fast, to be protective. My friends today, are you protective of your spouse, protective of your marriage that you will guard it with your life, with your time and all your resources? Not out of fear, really no, but it is out of love, out of faith, uh, out of duty and a sense of responsibility. It is like when you have your child with you, especially when they uh, were helpless and they need you to take care of them, you are protective of the child because that is your duty, your responsibility. The same thing it is with a marriage. Well, so, uh, so here he says, when, 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 when you are uh, protective and make that relationship exclusive because he or she belongs to you, then it's going to be a blessing for both of you. Heard of the phrase, a happy wife, a happy life? <laughs> well, this phrase, happy wife, happy life, is most often used to suggest that a marriage will be well-maintained and enjoyable if a partner makes, makes their wife happy first and foremost. 
And let me add to this, the outcome is going to be a happy spouse, a happy house. A happy wife brings about results in a happy life. A happy spouse will bring about a happy house. The second point I'd like to share with us, how to be protective of your marriage. Uh, the first would be exclusivity, okay? And secondly, enjoyment. Enjoy your spouse. Yes, yeah, as simple as it. Enjoy your spouse. Because there are a lot of couples out there, you're not enjoying one another, okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 9. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love. Listen to these words again. It's not just about enjoying life, but he said enjoy life with someone. Because without that someone, you can never fully enjoy life. Remember what I've just said. Because life is to be enjoyed with someone. And you have decided when you marry that person, you say, this is going to be that person. I'm going to dream out, uh, live on my dream, share my life till the end. Together, we grow old. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love. All the days of your vain life or earthly life that he has given you under the sun rather than focusing on her imperfections and weaknesses. Here, uh, 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 Solomon is saying, praise God for blessing you with your spouse or through your spouse. Uh, Proverbs 18 verse 22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord, obtains favor from the Lord. When you find your spouse, that is an expression of God's gift and His favor to you. Proverbs 19 verse 14, house and wealth are inherited from your earthly fathers, but a prudent wife is from your heavenly father, from the Lord. Powerful verse, young people, especially the singles, listen. Your earthly parents may give you earthly inheritance, but they cannot give you a good spouse. It is only from your heavenly Father. Powerful. Man, let God renew your vision of your spouse. I want to speak to the man. Your wife is still the lovely dear, the gentle doe you dated, <laughs> you married. Many years ago, she is God's good, very good and precious gift to you. And you know it. And I encourage you, I'm speaking to you, man to man here as a husband, that to enjoy your life with her. You know it. You know, without Yvonne, I, I enjoy life less. You know, without her, I, I, I missed her. You know, I will always say, how I wish Yvonne is with me. I'm going to bring her with me again to this place or to experience this wonderful experience because it's wonderful to be sharing something good in life with someone, not alone. It's lonely. Okay, and there's no other one and that is your spouse. Okay, so these two protections, ex exclusivity and enjoyment. When you, when you treat your spouse as the exclusive one, the only one, not the number one, the only one, not just another one, uh, that no one can ex replace that person, exclusive, unique, special. Uh, therefore, you protect it. And then the element, the attitude of enjoying that person as well. I tell you, there is no reason to be unfaithful in your marriage. If you're tempted away from your own source of sexual satisfaction, it is likely that your protective walls are crumbling. You're not treating your spouse as being exclusive and you're not enjoying your spouse. And that is a red flag. And be careful. And the solution, again, as I said, the remedy, the answer is not to abstain or to avoid sexual temptation, okay? But rather to enjoy it and to treat your spouse as the exclusive one. Some of us, all of us today, we need to ask ourselves, am I maintaining my marriage as an exclusive relationship? Not just another one, not just the number one, but the only one. My spouse, the only person in my life.
Am I guarding myself against inappropriate intimacy, relationship with others? Am I enjoying my spouse? That's the question. Are you satisfied with your spouse, both physically and emotionally? The moment you find yourself complaining and being dissatisfied with your spouse, that's the beginning of a downfall. A trap is right ahead of you, in front of you. For every word that you complain against your spouse, very soon, you're going to have a compliment for someone else. And, and that is a lie. That is not true. And Satan wants you to do that. You see, uh, uh, husband and wife, are you physically intimate in a way that you're satisfying one another completely? We'll end this message the way the book of Proverbs chapter 5 wants to end, with two reasons to pursue marital fidelity and faithfulness. Look at verse 20. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities, the sin of the wicked, ensnare him, and he is held fast in the courts of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. Well, a sexual sin is never done in private. It's not just about, you know, I don't affect other people. It's just, it's just me, okay? No, 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 no. It's, it's never private. It could be something that you do personally, but it's never contained privately, okay? It's going to spill over. But the first thing that is going to happen is that, you know, uh, sin is not done privately because God is always in private with us because God sees it. And not only that, He's a good Father who cares for you deeply. And, and one area it would be your sexual purity. As a father myself, having two children, I could feel it and I could appreciate this verse. How as a father, I do care for my children's purity, not to punish them, but because I know that's best for them, it will break my heart where they don't, okay? And then, of course, sexual sin, number two, not only God sees it and it breaks the heart of God, sexual sin is self-destructive. Yes, pleasure is involved, but it's only a little, only a little, briefly. But then it destroys you. Sexual sin is not only bad, it is foolish and it's illogical. I think of the man, men who commit adultery. Uh, it just don't make sense. It's foolish. It doesn't make sense. I know it makes complete sense to them because there is a deception involved. Uh, so, so, so when object, objectivity prevails, common sense kicks in, you begin to see your act as a foolish act. It's illogical. I'm talking to even the singles. Sex before marriage is foolish, it's illogical. Uh, one may think that as a, a privilege that single people get to enjoy, but that is not true. That is unbiblical, as I said earlier on. When a man chooses it, chooses sexual sin, he, he is choosing lust. He's choosing lies. He's choosing self-condemnation and guilt. He's choosing shame and disgrace. He's choosing self-destruction uh, and his future destroyed. He's choosing to live in regrets. He's choosing the road of foolishness. Uh, so what, 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 how do we want to conclude here, my friends? Uh, I, I want to say this because this message is supposed to be redeeming. I touch on a lot of sensitive areas that is oftentimes not talked about. As I said, in marriage struggle, marital struggle, we talk about a lot of other things, finances, communications, in-laws, so many things that we may talk about, parenting, but sexual uh, temptation, we don't want to address it because it's too personal, too private. But this is where there's 
spiritual enemy attacks us, where we struggle and we suffer alone, right? So, so let me say this. Uh, um, some of us may have sexual sin in the past. Uh, well, you can't just deny it and pretend it doesn't happen because that stronghold is still there. Uh, some of us are struggling with sexual sin right now. Some of us, it's coming and you know that there is a trap somewhere. Uh, but it is never too late because in Christ, He is more than able to heal us. There is no sin that He cannot forgive. There is no bondage He cannot deliver us. Uh, uh, today, you know, come to Jesus. And the first thing that we must do is to admit that we have a struggle there, admission before confession. Uh, because confession is good, but confession happens only when we admit. And that's the most difficult part uh, because we like to believe that we're not, bad in, we're not as bad as someone else, right? But, but, but when the Spirit of God speaks to you, then, then, then you know that you know, something is not right. And, and we admit it. We don't have to understand it all. Admit it before God. It's not meant to shame this, all right? But suddenly when you admit it, the power and the lies over it is broken. It's, you sense a sense of freedom and you confess it and God begins to bring healing and He has no more power over you. Jeremiah 2 verse 13 says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. This, this, this passage talks about the sin of uh, sexual sin. And the right way to respond is through repentance. And after repenting, God is going to bring reconciliation between you and God. You suddenly sense a new level of freedom and freshness. And then there is a new level of freedom and freshness with your spouse. Because unconfessed sin is going to bring about guilt between that, that is going to be coming between you and God and then guilt between you uh, 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 hindering your relationship with your spouse. That guilt, the wall of guilt. You know what I mean, the wall of guilt. So when, when there's repentance, then reconciliation. Guilt is no more. Then full restoration. Then you're on the road to a happy wife, a happy life, a happy spouse, a happy house. Repentance is the turning point. So in Jesus' name, today I want to believe and I want to pray, I want to release that you will receive full healing and deliverance from this bondage that is upon so many people. And young people, single ones as well. Today, you know, at the pornography last sometimes that stronghold is even stronger in our lives than married people. Uh, don't want to go into that because it's a long discussion altogether. But I know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, doesn't mean you're single, you're pure. No, not, it's not as simple as it is. We live in a very complex world. You know, pornography is one of those areas that have sucked in a lot of young people. Married people too, I know, young people to a point that it paralyzed them, handicapped them in their preparation for their future marriage. And that is altogether another topic for another day. But I want to break that in Jesus' name. Raise your hand in Jesus' name. I pray for God's freedom over you right now as you come to a place of admission and then confession and then repentance results in a reconciliation and a restoration. Today, your freedom come in Jesus' name. I break and I silence the voice of the enemy, the lies of the enemy, the darkness that is hovering and coming upon so many people and, and families and marriages that are struggling because of this stronghold. In Jesus' name, be removed. And I pray for a sense of spirituality and sincerity where you bring about a, 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 an attitude of uh, 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 celebrating uh, uh, their marriage, expressing their desire, not being afraid to express their need for one another today. I pray for healing today. Remove every walls. I know every couple face different challenges, but I pray, Father, in Jesus' name, 
the solution is still the same. Jesus is the solution. In Jesus' name, be healed today. May your eyes be opened. May you be set free today and be entangled no more, be imprisoned no more, be bound no more. In Jesus' name, set your people free. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I can sing of your love forever. 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 I can sing of your love. worship, why don't we all just uh, speak our own voices and sing our own songs to God. If you feel led, just speak in tongues, you know, just fill the place with your voice. And if you want to speak in your own language, just speak in your own language, but just sing praises to God. Yo no. 